and share my screen. All right. And here it is. How are you guys today? I've been doing good. I'm doing good. I haven't been getting much sleep though recently, but that's my own fault. You haven't been getting much sleep. Yeah, that's my own fault. I've been getting okay. to bed too late. I see. I see. Yeah, sleep is very important. Yeah, but you I'm doing pretty good. How are you, Zika? I'm doing well, thank you. I'm doing very well, thank you. Okay. That's good. So this is the agenda for the week. And I'm just going to wait one minute and then we will go over the agenda and we'll go over what's left. And then we will talk about uh, chapter eight, a very, very important chapter this, this week. Well, let's go ahead and get started. It's 10.01. So welcome to week seven, everybody. This is the agenda, not only for week seven, but for the rest of the quarter. So this week we're going over chapter eight, which is VPN and IPsec, super important chapter. And next week, we're gonna go over chapter nine, which is ASA, Adaptive Security Appliance. We've talked about ASA before, and uh, chapter nine is all about ASA and ASA services. And of course, one of those services is VPN. And uh, we're gonna skip chapter at 10, and I will show you why. It's just the GUI interface for the ASA. So we're gonna use the command line interface to configure uh, ASA in chapter nine, and chapter nine, 10 is just the GUI to do the same thing. And it doesn't work with packet tracer, and we're gonna skip it. And then week nine, the last instruction week, we're gonna go over chapter 11, which is the last chapter for this course, and this is managing a secure network. So like I said, we're going to be skipping uh, chapter 10. Chapter 10 is all about ASDM. And I wanted to show you this very quickly. So if I was to do Cisco SDM, and what is Cisco SDM? is a graphical user interface tool which can be used for routers and security deployment. So it's just a GUI. It's a GUI that we can use to configure switches. It's a GUI we can use to configure routers. And ASDM is the ASA version of SDM. So it is a GUI that will enable us to configure ASA device. And as we've said before, uh, GUIs are very friendly and nice to use, except they have limited capability. So you're almost always uh, limited to what you can do from inside a GUI. Uh, and as, an, as a system administrator, and that's what you guys are studying, to become system administrators, there is no escaping the command line interface. So nothing wrong with using a GUI, but uh, there's no escaping the command line interface. And if you're conf configuring a switch, a router, an ASA device for the very first time, I'm not really sure you want to use a GUI because you have a template file like we've been doing, and then you're gonna tweak it and you're gonna save that file as your configuration file. And then you're gonna go to the CLI and you're gonna copy and paste. And I think that is the way to go. Uh, but that's all I wanted to say about uh, SDM. And then ASDM, ASDM is the ASA uh, GUI. And we're skipping that chapter. So coming back here. And then week 10, we don't have a week 11. We only have week 10. And this is finals week. So in Tuesday of June 9, we're going to do the SBA from 10 to till when. So I'm gonna give you three hours to do that. And I will be placing the SBA files on Net Academy. In fact, I will show you uh, where the files will be. So let me go back here. And you see we have a files folder. And in here I have when dash SBA just to place it toward the very top. And right now it's empty, but that's where the files will be on um, June 9th. 
And then, of course, we still have the final exam, and we're doing the final exam on Thursday, June 11, from 10 till noon. Cisco recommends uh, 70 minutes. I'm giving you 120 minutes, so I don't think timing is going to be an issue. You'll have ample time to take the final exam. Any questions on what is the plan for the rest of the quarter? Okay. And if you want to see it visually, here it is, everybody. So we're going over chapter eight this week, week seven. We're going over chapter nine next week, week eight. We're going over in week nine. We're skipping chapter 10. And then we're doing the SBA and we're taking the final exam on uh, week 10, the last week for this quarter. If you have any questions, please ask. Otherwise, I'm going to move on. OK. And if we need to come back here, we can come back here. So the focus for this week is chapter 8. And we have today and we have Thursday, so we have ample time. Uh, and I'm sure you know we will cover it thoroughly between today and Thursday. So let's go ahead and get started with chapter 8. So implementing VPN, virtual private network, and I know this is not a new term for any of you, and hopefully VPNing into your home, uh, into your office, or into whatever you need to VPN into. So introducing VPNs, VPN benefits, cost is a huge benefit, everybody. So it used to be until some years ago that if a large company with multiple sites uh, you pick any large company with multiple sites and they wanted to connect those sites to one another, they would use leased lines. And those leased lines were really, really expensive. I managed a system for Hewlett Packard that had three leased lines between Dallas and Houston. So it's inside Texas. I know it's a big state. And uh, they were uh, T1 lines, 1.544 megabit per second line. And each line costed about $6,000 a month. So for those three lines, you know, Hewlett Packard was paying $18,000 a month. And if you were to combine the three, that's about 4.6 megabit per second. And you have far more than that in your cellular phone and you're paying far less. So a huge benefit of VPN is saving money. So this is one. Another one is security. We can encrypt. Okay, so we're not going to be sending data unencrypted over a VPN. That would not be wise. Anytime you want to use the public internet, a public network, you have to encrypt or you're assuming a huge responsibility. Scalability, we want to scale. And that actually the internet is wonderful for scalability because you get a connection to the internet, let's say, you know, one terabyte. And let's say, you know, your other office, your other site has a terabyte, and now you have two massive pipes into the internet and you can utilize those pipes to create a very large VPN pipe. And if that's not enough, then you upgrade. And it doesn't really cost a whole lot. A terabyte sounds like a lot and it is, but it doesn't really cost very much over the internet. So we can, we can scale that pipe to whatever size we want. And the same thing is true for your house and my house. And compatibility means that we can do this over many different network architectures. So Ethernet is a network architecture, but it's a local area network architecture. It's not a WAN architecture. And VPN, we're VPNing over the WAN, not over a LAN. So we want to be able to do this over serial cable. We want to be able to do this over fiber. We want to be able to do this over sonnet, over a frame relay, uh, you name it, over ATM. So whatever the network architecture is, we want to be able to do it over that network architecture. We, want, we don't want to be restrained. So these are all big benefits for VPN. Uh, and of course, I keep saying, and I will say it again today, is mature. OK, we're no longer experimenting. This is a mature infrastructure. The internet uh, scales to a massive scale. You can have a 10 megabit, a 1 gigabit, 10 gigabit connection to the internet. The uh, internet is secure. We can encrypt. The internet is reliable. It's a very, very reliable. It's a partial mesh with lots of backups. So if 
a particular device fails, we can work around it. And very, very important, which is the very first bullet here, is the internet is cheap. It is dirt cheap. It is unbelievably cheap. And to go back to three T1 uh, leased lines between Houston and Dallas costing $18,000 uh, a month, uh, you can have a massive pipe into the internet for far less than that. So it's really inexpensive and it's reliable and it's mature. So there's no escaping the internet these days. So these are the benefits. So layer three IPsec, I'm sure you remember this lovely table over here. So we're dealing with IPs, we're talking about the ISO OSI model and we're talking about layer three, okay? And IPsec stands for IP security. IPsec was designed for uh, IPv6 and it is actually built into IPv6. And of course we can use it with IPv4. It's an add-on for IPv4. And it is by far the most popular uh, technology framework that is being used for VPN today. And I will show you later on today, you know, we have lots of options to VPN. So there's no lack of options to VPN. We can use PPTP, we can use L2TP, we can use lots of different protocols and IPsec uh, is gaining popularity uh, for lots of good reasons and it's becoming, it is, it is the most popular framework for VPN. So what do we want to use VPN for? We want to use VPN to connect site to site. So a company has multiple sites and we want to connect those sites to each other and we can use VPNs to do that because it's far less expensive than using leased lines, which used to be the case. And we want to use VPN for mobile user. Uh, when I used to work for Hewlett Packard, I used to take my laptop, go to Starbucks, and I would VPN from Starbucks in, inside HP. And I would have access to everything I needed to have access to as if I was inside the building. And of course, these days, you know, we have millions of people working from home and working from wherever they're working, and they also need to VPN. So when we talk VPN, we're talking two different uh, categories of VPN site to site, and the connection is always on. It's not like, you know, you turn it on, you turn it off. It is always on. And then, of course, you know, we have home to site, and then you can turn it on and turn it off. And of course, if you're a mobile user, you enable it when you need it, and then you turn it off when you're done. And all of these are using these days are using uh, IPsec or IPsec framework is by far the most popular. So we talked about this, everybody. So we said uh, two types of VPN. So we have site to site where it's always on and the user is unaware. So if you're working on site A or if you're working on site B, you don't really know there is a VPN, nor do you really care. You just connect to your switch and you're doing business as you always did business. And then the routers will route between site A and site B using the VPN connection. And then we talked about the other connection, remote user uh, access. So we want this remote user to access the site and get an IP address from the site and have access to all the devices in physically on the site. So as far as the network is concerned, this user is on site even though they are sitting in a coffee shop. And of course we want to do it securely and we want to encrypt. So we will do labs for both of these types for site to site and for uh, remote access. So here they're showing us a, a remote user and do you see this device over here? The bottom part of it looks like a firewall, which it is. And the top part looks like a switch. This is the uh, icon that bought next week. And ASA devices are commonly used for VPN. So this is one of the many features that they offer and we will do this next week. So whenever you see this device over here, this is an ASA adaptive security appliance device. And this is uh, site to site. 
And like I said, with site to site, the users don't really know there's a VPN between site A and site B, nor do they really care. And it is always on. It's on seven by 24 because people are, or services are using that connection all the time. So people may go home at the end of the day, but you still have services running in the background overnight. IPsec. So all of that has been a preparation to get to IPsec. And I wanna go back to my table. Okay. So we've been talking a lot about SSL and TLS and SSL and TLS, and we said SSL has been deprecated and TLS is the new king or queen. So this is a single protocol. And this is a protocol that runs at the application layer. I'm talking TCP IP. So this is an application that runs at the application layer and the application has to decide if they want to encrypt or not. So HTTP doesn't, doesn't use SSL TLS, HTTP does. Okay, yeah. Telnet doesn't, SSH does, and so on. And then IPsec, as you can see from this table, it runs down at layer three, which means everything's gonna have to go through layer three and everything's gonna get encrypted. So if we're talking about the site-to-site -site connection, we don't really wanna leave it up to the user to decide if they wanna encrypt or not. We're gonna encrypt for them anyway. And if they're already encrypted, fine, we will encrypt twice. And that's no problem, and we do this all the time. Uh, so this is one big advantage for IPsec is it runs down here at layer three. And because everything has to go through layer three in the way out and then back in the way in, it's going to get encrypted. Um, so let's keep, let's keep that in mind. And then of course the same thing uh, for a remote user. If they're using IPsec, then IPsec is gonna run at layer three and everything is going to get encrypted. So what happened to that beautiful slide? Here it is. So IPsec is not a single protocol. It is a framework. I've been calling it a buffet. It is a framework. And this is another big advantage for IPsec is because it is a framework, we can add newer protocol. So let's say, you know, there's a newer encryption protocol, no big deal. We will just add it to the buffet table. So we don't have to change IPsec. We just have more options within IPsec. And the same thing is true for integrity algorithms and the same thing is true for authentication and the same thing is true for key exchange. It is a buffet and we can add uh, new dishes all the time. Now removing all dishes, while in theory we can, we don't want to break backward compatibility. So companies are reluctant to remove anything from the buffet table because if someone out there is using that protocol and we remove it and they upgrade, then it's gonna stop working. So we always have to be careful with backward compatibility. Uh, so IPsec protocols, so we have three protocols for IPsec or that IPsec uses. AH, which is uh, authenticating the header. This is the header of the packet. ESP, which is, in, uh, uh, which is encrypting the payload. So this is the encryption part. And then ESP plus AH is you can use both of them. So in, in reality, we only have two. We have AH, we have ESP, we can use AH alone, we can use ESP alone, or we can use both of them. And we will do both in our labs today. Some of them will use both, and some of them will only use one. So this is a choice you have. And then for confidentiality, we have a bunch of encrypting protocols, uh, DES, 3DES, AES and SEAL, and we're gonna be focusing on AES, which is Advanced Encryption System. Uh, and then for integrity, we can use MD5 and SHA, and SHA comes in three different families, SHA, SHA2, and three. And then authentication, pre-shared key, or RSA, RSA for a digital certificate, a digital ID, so you can use a pre-shared key. Uh, like a password that is known at both ends, or we can use digital IDs for the authentication piece. And Defi Hellman from now on will just refer to it as DH. It's a protocol that is going to ensure we have the same key at both ends of this exchange. So you have two sites or you have a remote user and a site, and we need a, a, the same password at both ends and the DH 
uh, protocol job is to make sure that securely we have the same password at each end. So the reason why you see a hole under uh, AH everybody, this from this picture over here, is because if you only want to use AH, you don't want to use encryption for the payload, then you don't really need confidentiality. And this is why this is uh, empty immediately below the AH. If you want to use ESP, then you don't really have a choice. You're gonna to have to choose one of those encryption protocols. And here they provided us with two examples. So example number one, we're only using a H. We're only authenticating the header. And you can see, you know, we're not using an encryption protocol. And over here, we're using both protocols, ESP plus a H. And we have to choose one of these confidentiality or encryption protocols. This is a great slide, everybody. This is the 1,000 foot level slide. And if this makes sense, then I think it will be easier to dive deeper into IPsec. So any questions here? Any questions about the framework? No? Makes sense? Okay. And I'm sure you remember those keywords. And just in case you don't remember them, so if you remember, uh, last week, we covered chapter eight, which is cryptography. We talked about cryptography and we talked about integrity quite a bit. And we said this is data integrity and we accomplished this through hashing. And this is where you see SHA one, two, and three. And down below, we talked about confidentiality and we said confidentiality is encryption. And we talked about the different uh, encryption Protocols, not all of them are supported by IPsec. For example, IPsec doesn't support the RC series of encryption protocols. And we talked about authentication and we said we can authenticate with a password, with a digital ID. We talked about uh, symmetric. No, sorry, that is for encryption. We talked about symmetric and asymmetric. So we talked about authentication that we can authenticate with a password, with a token, biometric. And we can also use digital certificates for authentication. And then we talked about MAC, message authentication code. And we said, not only are we interested in integrity, but we also want to authenticate. So MAC, it's providing two benefits. It's providing integrity. This is where we begin to mix and match. And we also want to use it for authentication. And then we talked about DH. And we said, we're using this series of protocols to securely exchange a pre-shared secret code password between the two parties that want to establish a VPN. So this is from last week. Okay, I'm gonna move on. Okay. So confidentiality with encryption. So I'm repeating myself here. So if we have two users and they want to uh, confidentiality communicate with one another, they will encrypt. Okay, so in this case, you know, we're using a symmetric key. We're using the same key to encrypt and to decrypt. Uh, think of it like a session key. So Gail over here is sending a message to Jeremy and Gail encrypted it. And when we encrypt, we scramble and then we're sending over the public internet and we have a bad actor that is listening to the traffic, the zeros and the ones, there's not much we can do to uh, prevent them from seeing the zeros and the ones, but they're not going to be able to make any sense of those zeros and the ones because they're encrypted. And then when Jeremy receives the message, uh, Jeremy computer will decrypt with the symmetric key and will be able to see the content of that message. Nothing new here, okay. And then we have to choose. So IPsec, we're talking IPsec here. We have to choose, okay, which encryption algorithm we want to use. DES, 56-bit key, very weak. Three DES, which doing DES three times, okay. It's a little longer, but still not the best encryption. AES is very, very good. And this is what we're going to be using. And AES comes in three different flavors. So whenever you choose AES, you have to tell the computer, do you want 128-bit, 192-bit, or 256-bit key? So you have a choice here. And or seal. So we can use any of these 
uh, encryption algorithms to accomplish the confidentiality. Integrity, we're using hashing everybody. So we hash and then we send the message along with the hash and then the receiving party will hash using the same hashing algorithm and then they will compare the two hash uh, keys or hash digest keys and if they're the same then the message was received uh, without being altered along the way. If they're different then we discard it because something happened and we've talked about this quite a bit last week. Okay. So this is hashing and we have to choose between MD5 and SHA. MD5 is 128 bit. It's good. It's not very, very good. SHA1 is 160 bit. So it's much better. So if I have to choose between the two, uh, I will choose SHA. And this is what we'll do today. And remember, we also support SHA2 and 3 that provide us longer keys. Authentication. We can authenticate with a pre-shared key. This is a shared password. So you and I have agreed on the password and we enter it into the system and it becomes a pre-shared uh, password. Or we can use RSA. And if you guys remember, we talked quite a bit about RSA and RSA is the algorithm we use with digital certificate. So we have a private public key and we can use that for authentication. And here they are showing us how it works with a PSK. Uh, if I'm going fast, it's because I feel like we've covered this before. And this is really a review of what we talked about last week. So with pre-shared key, so we have a message and then you know we, we add the key. So this is Mac, this is mes message authentication code, specifically HMAC hashing message authentication code. So we take the message, we add the key, okay, the pre-shared key, and then we hash the whole thing, and then we send it to the other side of the conversation. And then they take the message, and then they add the key, because they also have a copy of the key, and then they hash it with the same hashing algorithm, and then they compare the two keys. And if the two keys are the same, it's good. Not only did we accomplish integrity, but we also, uh, authenticated at the same time. So this is hitting two birds with one stone. We're doing integrity and we're doing authentication. And here we're focusing on the authentication, but we're also getting integrity. Remember, HMAC gives us two benefits, integrity and authentication. And if we are using RSA, if we're using a private public key, so this is uh, party A, this is party B, and you can see, you know, they are hashing and then they are encrypting with the private key. Because anything that is encrypted with the private keys means, you know, it came from me. No one else but me has the private key. And then the other party will decrypt with the public key. And then if the two values match, then yep, you know, it did come from Zico or it did come from site A. And then we'll do the opposite. And then, you know, the other site will create a hash and encrypt it with their private key. Because when we talk about authentication, both parties want to authenticate. It's not site A wants to authenticate site B and we're done. Well, site B also wants to authenticate site A. So the authentication has to happen at each end to make sure that these are two valid, uh, trusted parties. So this is authentication with pre-shared key and with RSA. And DH, and we said the purpose of DH is to securely exchange a key between the two parties that they can use for encryption. We said even if the two parties have a private and a public key, we don't really want to use that private public key for encryption and decryption because those keys are massive and they take a lot of resources. So we want to agree on a much shorter symmetric key and we want to use that symmetric key for encryption which is what we do in the majority of the time. And somehow we have to securely exchange that session key, that session symmetric key. And DH is a protocol that we use to accomplish that goal. So we're using DH to securely exchange or generate a session key between the two parties. So they can use that session key for encryption. Questions? 
All make sense? Joey, is, is this making sense to you? Yeah. Am I going fast? I don't think so. How about you, Bill? Okay. No, we're good. Okay. Michael, is this making sense? Okay, all right, then let's move on. Oh, oh. Okay. We do have labs and we will take our time with the labs. But before I get to the labs, I wanna make sure you understand the big picture and then we'll, we'll go between the trees. So now we're talking about the IPsec protocols. And I said we have two, and then we can combine them for a fair flavor if you like. So we can authenticate the header so you guys know we have a frame, we have a packet, we have a segment, it doesn't really matter. They all have a header. So AH is only to authenticate the header. This header really did come from you know, the trusted party. So remember, you always have two, two parties when we have a VPN, okay? So this really did come from the trusted party, okay? This is not a bad actor uh, piece of information. So that's all AH gives us. It just says, yep, this really did come. And then ESP is encrypting the payload because AH doesn't encrypt. AH says, okay, all you really wanted me to do is authenticate that this did come from the other side. And ESP is if you want to encrypt the payload, which of course you do. Of course you do, right? Anytime you go over the public internet, you want to encrypt. You never ever want to go over the public internet and you're not encrypting. But it is a choice. So the IPsec framework gave us this option. They said you can encrypt. If you don't want to, you don't have to encrypt. And if you want to, you can do both. And this is what we will do in some of the labs and we will do ASP in some other labs. And of course you can experiment and do what you want. But these are your options. AH only, ASP only, or both. And of course, both makes sense. But please remember, you're always paying a tax. You're paying a tax for AH authentication because you have to authenticate each packet and you're paying a price for ESP because you have to encrypt and decrypt and you're paying a tax if you wanna use both. But anytime you're going over the public internet, encryption isn't really a question unless you're sending uh, very, very low priority data. You don't really care if people see it or not. But if you value the data you're transmitting, you encrypt. And oftentimes people don't know. So they say, you know, we're not gonna take any chances. We're just going to encrypt because we don't know. Maybe 99% of the time it is low priority data, but you know, 1% of the time it's important data. And you don't really know when you're transmitting low priority and when you're transmitting sensitive. So you encrypt all the time. Or just go with the rule of thumb, you know, encrypt. You don't have to debate that point. All right, AH protocol. So what's missing from this picture right here is the encryption, is the confidentiality. So this is the same slide we were looking at before and it's missing confidentiality because if you only want to use authenticating header, you know, you are not encrypting. Okay. So how do we authenticate the header? We use the hash. So remember we have a pre-shared key and then we're using HMAC back to HMAC and HMAC gives us two benefits. It gives us integrity and it gives us uh, authentication. It says, yep, this really did come from the other side because they used the pre-shared key. So you can see right here, we have the IP header, we have the data plus the key and this is the PSK. This is the pre-shared key. And then we hash the whole thing and we send it along, along with the message. And then the other side of the conversation, you know, site B will take the message, add the key, hash the whole thing, and then they will compare those two keys. And if the two keys are the same, yep, this is good. This really did come from, the, from site B. And if they are different, then it will discard it because I'm not sure where this came from. So this is HMAC which we talked about last week. And this is what we use to authenticate the header. And you can see there's a little bit of a tax. And this is for each packet. 
for every single packet. Okay, this is the packet IP header. Well, IP header is, you know, a packet by default and the payload. And then we're adding the uh, pre-shared key. ESP is encryption. And now you can see the difference between this slide and this slide is we have confidentiality. And ESP is for encrypting the payload. Okay, and we have a choice. And we can choose from among these different uh, protocols. And later on, I'm sure they will be adding more. But right now, this is what IPsec supports. Uh, DES is very, very weak. A three DES is three times better, but you know, not very, very good. Uh, AES is excellent. And it gives us uh, three different choices for a key length and you can choose what you want. And we're gonna choose 256, which is the strongest. Again, you know, you're paying a higher tax for 256 versus, you know, 128. And then integrity, we talked about integrity. We talked about uh, authentication, pre-shared key, which is what we're looking at before, or RSA. If anytime you see RSA, we're talking digital certificate. And now they are showing us. So this is site to site. Clearly everybody, you have a router on this side, you have a router on the other side. So this is site A, this is site B, and we want to VPN over the internet. And ESP encryption and authentication. So this is what ESP does. It encrypts and it authenticates as well. And basically what we're doing is we're encapsulating the IP packet into a new packet. That way, you know, we're protecting everybody. We're protecting the entire packet. We're protecting the payload and we're protecting the header. Good. So, and this is something we do often in networking, especially when we are VPNing. We encapsulate the packet inside a newer packet. And then at the other end, we remove the wrapper and then we extract the real packet. And that's what we forward to the destination. So this is what this is telling us. Excellent. Okay. So when we talk about uh, IPsec transport, we have two different modes. We have a tunnel mode and we have a transport mode. And please understand this. And it's not very hard to understand, but you know, make sure you understand the distinction between the two. So the tunnel mode is when you're going, when you when you're using IPsec for site to site. So you have site A, you have site B, you have a router over here, you have a router over here, and we're using the tunnel mode, which is the default mode. So by default, IPsec you know, is going to use tunnel mode because it's assuming you wanna connect site A to site B. And when you're connecting between site A and site B using a router at each end, we have the luxury of encapsulating the entire packet inside a new packet and then take the wrapper at the other end, which is what we're talking about before. If you are in transport mode, transport mode meaning this is you working from the home and tunneling to the office. This is you working from a coffee shop and tunneling into the office. So it's not the router to router, it's a computer to a router. Okay, we don't have the luxury of encrypting the header because we need the header information to get to our destination. Am I making sense everybody? So we want to encrypt, but we can't encrypt the header. We can only encrypt the payload. So this is the difference between transport mode and tunnel mode. Tunnel mode says it's router to router. I can encrypt the whole thing, no problem. Transport mode means it's a PC, it's a computer to a router. And we don't have the luxury of encrypting the whole thing. Because if you were to encrypt the whole thing, then how are you going to get to where you're going to go? So we can only encrypt the payload. And this is what this is telling us. Okay, we have a tunnel mode and transport mode. And the tunnel mode is between a home or a coffee shop and a corporate office. And the uh, that is the transport mode. And then the tunnel mode is between two routers. Usually it's site A and site B. We're good. Okay, so let's move on. IKE, okay, and IKE stands for Internet Key Exchange. And IKE is super popular these days. So IKE is the framework that we're going to use to establish that IPsec VPN tunnel. Good, everybody. So this is the framework 
these are the protocols we'll be using to establish the IPsec VPN tunnel. So internet key exchange protocol. So basically we have to agree on all these informations, right? This is what we talked about before. Are you gonna use AH? Are you gonna use ESP? Are you gonna use both? Okay, what are you gonna use for confidentiality if you're using ESP? What are we using for integrity? What are we using for authentication? Which DH protocol are we using? So we have to agree between those two sites, site A and site B, you in a coffee shop and your headquarter. We have to agree. The two ends have to agree. And this is what IKE does. You know, it enables this to happen efficiently and fairly quickly, that they both agree. And as you can see, the two sides have to be the same. You can't say AH over here and ESP on the other end. It's not gonna work. It's gonna be confusing. You can not say AES over here and something different over there. And you can definitely say pre-share key here and a digital certificate on the other end. So if you were to look at the slides, they're exactly the same because they have to be exactly the same. And IKE takes care of that. So IKE phase one makes sure that, yep, you know, we have an agreement on both ends for this tunnel to happen. Okay. So IKE happens in two phases. So phase one and phase two. And I will show you a better slide later on. And then the policy is what we're talking about. All this stuff is the policy. So we have to create a policy and we have to agree on a policy. And you can call the you can give the policy any number you want. And you can see the policies don't have to agree because in device A, you can say I'm using device A policy 10, and in device B, you can say I'm using policy 15. What they have to be the same is what's inside that policy. So the policy number doesn't matter because that's local. However, what you're putting inside the policy matters greatly. So we're creating a policy and we're saying we want to use advanced encryption. We want to use SHA, so AES for confidentiality, uh, SHA for integrity, pre-shared key. We're gonna use DH14. The bigger the DH number, the longer the, uh, the, the, longer the pre-shared key can be. So the length of the pre-shared key depends on which DH you're using. Older is smaller, uh, newer is longer. Lifetime is how long do you wanna go before you have to renegotiate that DH key. And if you were to stop and think about it, you know, we are using DH to exchange a key or to generate a key uh, on both ends of this conversation. Well, we don't wanna use this key for a month. We don't wanna use this key for a day because it may get compromised and now we have a problem. So we want to renew this key. And this is what the lifetime does. It says, okay, how, how long do you wanna wait before you renegotiate a new key? between those two parties. And then we're using DH key exchange to securely exchange a symmetric key uh, among the two sides. And then we have to verify the identity. Yep, you know, this is the party I really want to talk to. And we establish what's called an ISA camp, everybody an ISA camp tunnel. So we already have a tunnel. And now we need to create the IPsec tunnel inside that tunnel. And inside the IPsec tunnel is where we're doing all the encryption. And this is phase two. And phase two is negotiate IPsec policy for sending secure traffic across the tunnel. So if you really want a visualization, just visualize two tunnels. A, a visualize an ISA camp tunnel that we established initially and we needed that policy for. And then inside that tunnel, we're creating a second IPsec tunnel where we're actually encrypting the data. And we will take a closer look at phase one and phase two. And SA stands for security association. So this is what we want. We want a security association between R1 and R2. And this is the data we're using to establish that security association. Okay. And in fact, we have two different security association. We have an ISA camp security association, and then we have an IPsec security association. And I will show you this when we do the lab. But for now, it's really important for me that you understand this at a thousand foot level, a thousand foot level. 
before we dive into the details. Because if it doesn't make sense at the thousand foot level, it's gonna be hard to internalize, you know, once we get into the details. So remember, two tunnels, okay, and then, you know, first we create the ISA camp and then we create the IPsec inside. And we have those security associations. And we're using different keys. So it's a different set of keys for the ISA camp and a different set of keys, encryption keys for the IPsec. So they're going over the steps in a little bit more detail. There's nothing complicated here. The slides look complicated, they really aren't. So IPsec VPN negotiation, step one, host A sends interesting traffic to host B. So let's talk about interesting traffic, everybody, interesting. There is nothing interesting about the traffic. You just have to send a traffic because in order for this VPN to be established, there has to be some traffic going across. So you set up site A, you set up site B and there's no traffic going across. You don't really have a VPN. So for the VPN to get established, you have to have some traffic going across. And they called it interesting traffic, but there's nothing interesting about it. It's just traffic. So you can ping, and no one has ever called ping traffic interesting traffic, but it's traffic. And in this definition, it's an interesting traffic. So we have to do this in order for the VPN to be established. IVPN, IPsec VPN negotiation, step two, R1 and R2 negotiate, IKE, internet key exchange, phase one. Do you guys remember? Here, hold on. This is phase one right here. This is the ISA camp pipe. Okay, and we have to agree on encryption and integrity, pre-shared key or RSA, uh, which DH algorithm we want to use, the lifetime before we renegotiate those keys. So this is step two. So we have to create the ISA camp pipe. Step three, R1 and R2 negotiate phase two, and phase two is IPsec. Cool, everybody? So we have to have some interesting traffic, and if everything is already set up, then we create the ISA camp tunnel, and then we create the IPsec tunnel. And step number four, information will go back and forth, encrypted and secure. And step number five is we terminate the tunnel. Okay. Remember, if you're a home user, if you're working out of a coffee, you're going to terminate this tunnel. If it's site to site, it's up and running all the time. You're not going to bring it up at eight in the morning and shut it down at five in the afternoon because work is happening overnight and data is flowing overnight. Uh, but in theory, you know, eventually you're going to have to bring that session to an end. Okay. So site to site. This is a good slide, everybody. So we're talking about the security policy. Remember security policy 10, security policy 15. So encrypt traffic with AES-256 and AES-SHA. AES for confidentiality, SHA for integrity. Okay, authentication with pre-shared key, we're not using RSA. Okay, exchange group is 24, this is DH24. So this is a very recent DH protocol and it supports a longer key. This is all it means, it just means it supports a longer key and the longer key is more secure. Okay, uh, ISA camp tunnel, remember we have two tunnels, we have an ISA camp tunnel and we have an IPsec tunnel. So renegotiate the keys every one hour, which is good. One hour is very good. And then the IPsec tunnel renegotiate the keys every 15 minutes. So every 15 minutes, we have to interrupt the IPsec to exchange a new set of keys between site A and site B, you and the corporate office. And then every one hour, we have to do the same thing. We have to interrupt the connection for a little bit while we negotiate. And that takes a few seconds. So there will be a few second hit each time you renegotiate the keys. However, it's a price companies are willing to pay for higher security. And this is adjustable. I think you know the maximum is one day. I don't think they will allow you to enter a number bigger than 24 hours. So they're saying worst case scenario, you have to renegotiate at least once a day. 
and most companies will renegotiate more than once a day. And this is to make sure that those keys don't get compromised and then the whole uh, VPN becomes compromised. And we will come back to this later on. Configure the ISAC and policy. So basically when you're doing your configuration on the router one and the router two, this is what you need to do. Configure the ISAC and policy for IKE phase one, the ISAC and configure the IPsec policy for phase two, which is the IPsec tunnel. Okay, configure the crypto map. Basically, we have to map those policies to an interface, right, everybody? So this is serial 000 and router one, and it is serial 000 and router two. Well, we have to map the policy to that interface, okay? And then apply IPsec and verify everything is working. And you're gonna send some interesting traffic and the uh, tunnels are gonna get established and now you're sending secure data back and forth. And you will see this in the example, in the lab we do. And now we're getting into the details. So they are showing us the uh, CLI commands, which I will show you. You do have to create an access list. You do have to create an ACL, everybody. And the ACL basically says, what kind of traffic do you wanna allow over this IPsec? And it can be as generic as uh, IP any any, meaning, okay, you can send any data you want, or it can be as precise as you want it to be. And I believe in chapter four, we talked plenty about ACLs. So you do have to create an ACL and say, what kind of traffic do you want to allow? GRE, do you guys remember GRE? We covered GRE and CIS, 154, I could be wrong, but I believe we covered GRE in uh, CIS 154. And GRE is a Cisco protocol. It's not an open protocol, it's a Cisco protocol. And GRE is a tunneling protocol. It will establish a tunnel between two points. The problem with GRE is it doesn't encrypt. There's nothing wrong with it. A, it's not open, which means you can't use it everywhere. It's a Cisco protocol. And B is it doesn't encrypt. So it's gonna go ahead and establish a tunnel between R1 and R2, but there is no encryption. And that is a serious problem. We already covered this before. You never ever wanna send data over the public internet that isn't encrypted. However, what you can do is you can use GRE for the first pipe. And then if we really want to, we can use IPsec inside GRE. And then we can encrypt inside the second uh, pipe that we create between router one and router two. I don't think this is very popular. I think, you know, just using IKE, uh, internet key exchange, uh, phase one and phase two, I think that is far more popular. So we'll have IKE do the whole thing instead of GRE do a part of it and IPsec do the other part. But I'm just telling you, if you want to, you can use GRE and IPsec at the same time, there's nothing preventing you from using IPsec inside GRE. This is all this is saying. All right, so we do have some default policies. So they're saying you don't really have to sit there and agree on the details for these policies. If you want to, you can use a default policies. And there's one default policy for pre-shared key and one default policy for RSA. And then if you were to go and we'll do this and say crypto ISACAMP policy when question mark and this number doesn't really matter. It has a local significance. And then it says, okay, this is the menu. Choose from this menu. And some of these options have their own menus and they will say, okay, you selected this option. Now you can choose one of the three uh, options for this particular option. IPsec, so basically we establish the security association. Everybody show crypto ISAC camp. ISAC camp is IKE phase one, the bigger pipe, the first pipe we created, and we have a security association. And I will show you that. And initially it's gonna be empty until you have some interesting traffic. And if everything is configured properly, then it's gonna establish that first pipe between R1 and R2. 
this is the access list. What kind of traffic do you want to allow across? And you can be as narrow as you want, or you can be as open as you want. Okay, permit IP any any, and it's going to permit everything. So when it comes to the IPsec protocols, remember we have AH and ESP. So they're saying, okay, you know, decide what you want. So this is the menu to choose from. And you can choose AH only, you can use ESP only, or you can use both. And then they're giving you options. So do you want AH MD5 or do you want AH SHA? Or do you want AH SHA 256? Everybody, and you can see HMAC for hash, message authentication code, which we talked about last week. So we're using this for integrity and authentication because AH is uh, authenticate header. And this is what we're using to authenticate the other party, HMAC. And then ESP, they also give us a bunch of options. We're not gonna have nearly as many options inside Packet Tracer, but we do have options and we can choose from those options. So this is where you choose which of the IPsec protocols you want to use. And then we create the transform set, okay. We, the crypto map is basically where you're mapping a policy to an interface because that router has many interfaces and exactly which interface you want to use to establish the tunnel, okay. And we send interesting traffic and it happens. So before I dive into the labs, any questions on where we are? A thousand foot level. So companies across planet Earth that wanna connect sites to one another, and this is any really small, medium sized company with more than one site, including LBCC, we have the Albany site, we have the Benton Center site, we have the Lebanon site, right, everybody? And we wanna connect those sites to each other. Uh, we can use VPN to do that because leased lines are very expensive. And all of these sites have a connection to the internet and we may as well use that connection to the internet to create a secure VPN between us. And we don't have to pay any extra money for it we're already paying for the connection to the internet. And now you can use it for whatever purpose you want, including creating VPNs. So saving money is a huge deal. Like I said, you know, the bigger the connection to the internet, the bigger the pipe, the VPN pipe can be. And it supports all WAN architectures. So there's no limitation on how you connect to the internet and how the ISP uses to connect to other ISPs. And the same thing is true for uh, home users. So the last, I don't know how many years I worked for HP, I worked from my house and I VPN every morning. I will come to this very chair and I will VPN. And when I'm done at the end of the day, I will shut it down because I wasn't doing anything from my PC overnight and I didn't want to run it overnight. So I will kill the VPN connection. So that was a daily thing that I did from my PC. And we used a Cisco, piece of software called um, AnyConnect. And Microsoft has VPN built into it and I will show you that uh, later on today. And today, as we speak, you know, there are tens of millions of people that are working from home because of COVID-19. And anyone that needs access to devices inside the enterprise, they have to VPN. You don't need to VPN to get to your email. You don't need VPN to get to the internet. But if you have devices, services inside your company and you want to have access to those devices from home, you don't really have a choice. You have to VPN and then it will give you an IP address from your company. And uh, as far as the network is concerned, you know, you're physically inside your, your enterprise. Site to site or remote user, I'm not gonna go over this, but I wanted to stop here. IPsec is a framework. And this is one of the reasons why IPsec will be around 10 years from now, 20 years from now, because we will have newer protocols, but they will just add them to IPsec. 
So they will just keep adding new dishes to the buffet and uh, it will still be called IPsec with new options. But these are the options as of right now, 2020. Questions? Come on. I know you have questions. Or you just want to see the lab? Sense when I see uh, uh, or work on the labs. Okay, say, say it again, Joey. I got the last part. Um, it'll come together a little bit better okay. in my head uh, okay. seeing the lab. So let's leave the slide here just in case we need to come back to it. And let's do lab one. So let's go to the labs. I want to start here. Do you guys remember this slide? Okay. So basically, they are saying in order for you to use the crypto command, you have to have the security module, the security package. And it's enabled on the uh, packet tracer labs we're using. Um, so if you wanna, when you want to create your own, make sure to enable. And we've covered this in some detail in a couple of chapters. And then this, the tasks, everybody, to accomplish a site-to-site -site IPsec VPN tunnel First, we have to do IKE phase one to create the ISAC camp tunnel. And then we have to do the IKE phase two to create the IPSEC tunnel, right? And then we have to send interesting traffic, okay? Because without traffic, we're not going to open up that VPN connection. And then we have to do the, uh, the, the crypto map, okay? So we have to map the policy to an interface. And then we have to apply the policy and then you know it should be operational so these are the steps and in the lab you're going to see me say task one task two task three task four and when i'm saying task two i'm talking about this task right here everybody so i'm referencing those tasks so i'm going to leave this here and then let's take a closer look at ike so this is ike phase one okay and it comes in two different flavors uh, packet tracer doesn't support that but you know the real routers do uh, so we have main mode and aggressive mode and main mode protects your partner so if someone is trying to hack you know you don't really want them to know who your partner is and aggressive mode exposes your partner so they will know who the other side of this conversation is so this is the difference between the main mode and the aggressive mode and the main mode is the default. And aggressive mode will save you a little bit of time. It's all about, okay, what do I shave? So I establish a connection faster. Make sense, everybody? It, it, let's say it takes five seconds. Is there anything I can shave to make it four seconds, three seconds? Because being down for five seconds means you know things aren't happening for five seconds. So this is phase one. This is the ISA camp pipe. Okay. So authenticate each other. Okay, and we're using HMAC for that and a pre shared key. And we have the options are pre shared key, RSA, which is a digital signature. Okay. And then we have to negotiate the, the SA policy, the security association policy. This is policy 10, policy 15, encryption, integrity, etc. Okay. And this is to protect the exchange because when the IPsec is being established, we want to protect that. So we establish the first pipe and we do some encryption over there. So when the new pipe is being created, it's being created in a protected mode because what if a hacker is listening during this VPN establishment? Uh, if we're not protecting that, that communication, they may be able to hack into the network. Okay, and then perform an authenticated the edge exchange, and now we have to exchange the keys, the keys that we're going to be using, those are the symmetric keys, and then set up a secure tunnel to negotiate phase two, and phase two is IPsec, and this is the next slide I want to show you, and this is phase two, and phase two only supports quick mode, and negotiate IPsec security association between router one and router two, 
establish the IPsec security association and keys inbound and outbound. This is basically the symmetric keys. And periodically renegotiate. So we said, you know, you don't want to establish the keys and use them for a week because it's giving someone a lot of time to hack those keys and get in. So every hour, every few hours, no more than once a day, a maximum of 24 hours, you have to renegotiate the keys. You have to renegotiate the keys for the ISEC camp pipe, and you have to renegotiate the keys for the IPsec pipe. Okay. Optionally perform an additional DH exchange. Okay, and this is if you think there is some suspicious activities going on. So you remember this quick mode up here, quick mode provides replay protection. And what replay protection means is someone captured a packet and then they are sending this packet in the hope of getting a reply back. And the thing about IPsec is they give each packet a number. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So if they see ten again, it's like, whoa, wait a second, I already processed ten. You know, how come I'm seeing ten one more time? And this is the quick mode. So we have this uh, PFS, and you will see it in the lab. And this means perfect forward security, which means anytime IPsec suspects there's an attack, go ahead and generate a new set of keys. So the time hasn't elapsed. If you agree that you're going to do this every hour and 15 minutes into this one hour, you suspect there is an attack. It's like, okay, let's drop the keys and let's uh, negotiate new set of keys because maybe the keys got um, compromised. Good, lots of security, lots and lots and lots of security built in. And this is why IPsec is the new king for VPNs site to site and remote user to a site. IPsec is the new king and it's gaining track. It's becoming more popular. And I think it's gonna get to a point where it already is the gold standard. So IPsec already is the gold standard for VPN. Okay, I will save this in case we need to come back. So let's do our first lab. There's really two very good videos, everybody on Net Academy. And uh, I think both of them are six, seven, eight minutes long, not very long. So I strongly recommend that you watch both of them. So when you're going over the Net Academy and you get to the video, please watch the video. They are short and they are very, very good. And you can stop and think and you can replay until it makes sense to you. So let's do our first lab. All right, let me make this a little bigger. So the goal is to establish a VPN between those two sites. So this is site A and this is site B, router to router. And then the next lab is a remote user to a router. So this is router to router internet over here everybody and we want to create a secure tunnel between r2 and r3 so let's do a quick review before we get into this isa camp review internet security association and key management exchange this is what isa camp and it's pronounced isa camp everybody is used for negotiation establishing modification and deletion of security association between the two ends and related perimeters. It defines the procedures and packet formats for peer authentication creations and management of security associations and techniques for key negotiation. So this is what we do in the first pipe. Okay. And IKE, Internet Key Exchange, defines an automatic means of negotiating and authentication for IPsec security association. So two different SAs. We have an ISACAMP SA, and we have an IPsec SA, and IKE establishes the shared security policy and authenticated keys for IPsec. Crypto map, you're going to see this later on, 
A crypto map is a software configuration entity that performs two primary functions. Selects data flows that need security processing. This is basically our access list saying what data can flow. Okay, and defines the policy. So we created a policy and we want to map the policy to an interface. And that's what the crypto map is. And before you start, let's look at these routers really quick. Okay. So let's come over here. This is router two. We're just gonna look at the table IP route. Okay. And I don't have a dynamic routing protocol running. I do have a gateway of last resort and it's sending everything to R0. Everybody is sending everything to R0. And the same thing is true for R3. So IP route, and you can see, okay, R3 doesn't know about 172.1612, and R2 doesn't know about 172.1622, or 20 and 10. So there's no way for them to route. So if I was to come to PC0 and ping PC2, it's gonna fail because this router says, I don't know where 172.1622 is. It's gonna send it to R0, and these two guys will play ping pong with it. Let me show you. Ping 172.16.22. So it's going to fail. Okay. Fail. Okay. So it's just going to fail. Okay. There's no way. And this is the interesting traffic. Everybody said, I'm going to leave this running because that is the interesting traffic. Remember, we need interesting traffic for the tunnel to be established. And then to come over here, R0, so IP route, okay. And it sends everything to R1 and R1 sends everything to R0. Good, everybody. So the point is, no. There's no way for this subnet to connect to this subnet. But then after we establish a tunnel between R2 and R3, okay, then you know they will be able to communicate with one another. That's the whole point. This is your home local area network and your office local area network. And you don't really have a connection until you establish the VPN or this is site A and site B. So let's take a closer look at the file. So we've done all of this. So R2, okay. Task one, do you guys remember task one? Task one. So those tasks map to these numbers right here. Okay. Configure ISACAM policy parameters for IKE phase one. This is the ISACAM VPN connection. Crypto, remember you need the security K9 okay package to use this command otherwise you're going to get an error message i second policy 10 10 is a local significance so r3 can call this 15 20 30 it doesn't really matter what matters is what's inside the policy but the number only has a local significance and then i'm saying encryption as 256 i'm saying hash sha i'm saying group 5 because this is the largest number packet tracer supports. The relationship between the number and the symmetric key is how long that symmetric key is. Lifetime for the ISA camp before it has to renegotiate the keys is 3,600 seconds, which is one hour. So I'm basically saying every hour, I generate new keys. Okay. And then that's it. And then coming down here, okay, it's a pre-shared key and the pre-shared key is secret key, okay? And my neighbor, the other side, my partner in this VPN is 200122. 200.122 is this interface right here on R3. Okay. And then task two, everybody. And this is task two right here. Okay, configure the IPsec policy for phase two. Okay, mode is tunnel. Remember we have tunnel and we have transport and tunnel is the default. Okay, 
And down here, I'm saying we are using AH and ESP. So this is here. IPsec protocols, do you only want to authenticate the header? Do you only want to encrypt the payload or do you want to do both? And I'm doing both in this lab, okay? And these are the options. I'm creating that transform set. You give it whatever name you want and I just called it R2 to R3 and then from RT, R3 to R2, it only has a local significance. And then AH for authenticating header, MD5 for a hash algorithm, HMAC is to authenticate and to hash. And then ESP is to encrypt the payload. I'm using AES and I'm using AES 256. And then I'm using HMA to authenticate using a hash key. So this is what these guys mean. Okay, access list. Remember, it can be as tight or as open as you want it to be. In my case, I'm saying anything that is flowing between these two local area networks. Crypto map, okay, PFS, okay, perfect forward security. This is optional and extra security. Defends against replay attacks. If someone captured a packet or two or three and they're trying to replay it, an IPsec will find out and it's gonna say, okay, let me generate a new key and then it's gonna generate a new set of keys. This is what PFS is, okay. And then I'm creating the map, okay, and I'm using 10, everybody. 10 is this 10 right here, and this is why it's a local significance. Very good, okay. And I'm matching it to this access list, 101, and I'm using this transform, basically I'm bundling it all together. So I defined everything up above and now I'm bundling it all together. Okay, I'm using PFS. Remember PFS to regenerate the key if there's an attack. And then I have a lifetime of 900, which is what, 10 seconds. So I'm saying, sorry, 10 minutes, every 10 minutes. Is that right? 60, yeah, no, 15 minutes right here. 15 minutes. So every 15 minutes, I want to renegotiate the IPsec keys. So I'm negotiating the ISEC camp keys every one hour and the IPsec keys every 15 minutes. And remember, there's a price we pay for that. There will be an interruption in communication until this task is completed. And that task may take, you know, two, three seconds. Uh, and if you want, you can make this window really small like 30 seconds, and then you can watch it. You can do a ping and wait 30 seconds, and then you will see the ping will fail a few times, and then it will be reestablished because the negotiation for those new keys completed. Okay, and then I have to apply it to an interface, and I'm applying it to this interface because this is the interface that is going out, and I'm done. So let's take a closer look everybody. So I'm gonna come to R2. Crypto, ISA camp policy, and then you put a number. Okay, I'm gonna do one for now, and then a question mark, and these are your options. Okay, and it doesn't really matter, the order doesn't really matter. So let me say encryption question mark, and it says, what would you like to use? I have options, AES, question mark. Do you want 128? Do you want 256? I want 256. So you have lots of choices here. And then for hash, question mark, do you wanna use MD5 or SHA? And if SHA doesn't have a dash number next to it, it's dash one, which is 160 bits and then you can choose what you want. Let me choose, you know, SHA, okay. And then for authentication, question mark, it doesn't support RSA. This is packet tracer, so my only choice is pre-shared. Okay, very good group, question mark. 
I can choose between one, two, and five. It doesn't support anything above five, so I will go with five because this is my best option. And then lifetime, question mark. Okay, from 60, a minimum of one minute and a maximum of one day, if you were to do the math. And one minute is far too often because it means every minute you're gonna interrupt the connection and one day maybe is too long. So maybe an hour or less than an hour is, is good. And I think one hour for the ISA camp in 15 minutes for the IPSEC is quite common. At least this is the recommendation. Okay. And then let me come down here. I wanna show you what the IPSEC protocol options are. So exit crypto IPSEC. Okay, and then you can call R2, R3 is just a name, X, Y, Z, and then question mark. And those are my options. These are the IPSEC protocol options. Do you only want AH? Do you only want ESP? And then you have to choose which flavor of AH and which flavor of ASP. So I can say AH MD5, HMAC and then ESP, okay, AES question mark at 256, okay, and I'm not done, and then ESP MD5 HMAC, ESP, ESP SHA. Here we go. So let me go over this with you, okay? I am basically saying this is what I want to do to authenticate the header. I'm using MD5 for hashing and HMAC for authentication. And then for encryption, I'm using AES256 for encryption and HMAC for authentication. So I'm authenticating the header and I'm authenticating the payload and I'm encrypting. Just wanted to show you the options. So let's do it. I'm gonna redo the lab, copy and paste. I want you to know this is a lot. So if you're saying, wow, this is a lot, it is a lot. And you're gonna have to go over it multiple times in your own until it makes sense. And it will make sense. And I already said IPsec is the gold standard. And VPN is what everybody does. Okay, the odds are very high when you have a job, you will be able to VPN into your company. And the odds are very high you will be using IPsec. So let's copy and paste all of this stuff for router two. And over here, everybody, I just wanna show you, it's saying, okay, note, this is iOS. Okay, the new crypto map will remain disabled until a peer and a valid access list has been configured. Okay, very good, until we have a partner. Okay, it's not gonna do anything until we have a partner. Down here, so run and you'll see everything we did. This is the security policy with all of its parameters. This is the secret key. This is the map. Okay, so this is everything we did and this is the access list. And show crypto, remember we have two pipes, ISA camp, security association, we don't have one yet. We haven't configured router three, nor have we been sending interesting traffic. And then the same thing for IPsec. Okay, security association and no data is flowing. So let's configure router three. And I'm not gonna go over the configuration because it's exactly the same everybody. They have to be the same or you're gonna have problem. Now I have to tell you the lifetime can be different and then you know, you're gonna negotiate at the earliest time. So if the lifetime is one hour on one end and the lifetime is 15 minutes, well, you're gonna, negotiate every 15 minutes. 
So it's best to have the match exactly the same, or you're gonna be creating more work for yourself. So this is exactly the same. Everything is exactly the same, except from R3 point of view. paste and if we were to come back here nothing still who wants to tell me why still nothing's going on no data it's because we need that interesting traffic so let's go ahead and do the interesting traffic just traffic nothing interesting about it ping minus t 172.16.22. Okay. And it's going to take a while. So we can sit here for a minute or two and let it do its thing, or we can speed it up. So I'm going to speed it up, everybody. Here we go. Okay. And now the two connections. Remember, there's quite a bit of work that needs to happen. First, we have to establish the ISA camp pipe, and then we have to establish the IPsec pipe within that pipe and now traffic can flow back and forth. And now if I was to come back here, so now you can see I, I have association, so source and destination and it's active. And now if I was to do IPsec and you can see packets are flowing back and forth. And we're using the parameters we agreed on. And now anything, it doesn't matter what you're doing between uh, router one and router three, it's going to be encrypted. It's gonna be encrypted using the parameters we agreed to. Joey, does this help? Yeah, it does a lot. Okay. How about the rest of you? I know it's a lot, and I try to give you a lot of information to help you put it all together. So as you go down this lab, you know, okay, this is phase one, and I strongly recommend you come back here. Okay, task one, two, three, four, five, and you can see the same tasks are here. And I'm trying to explain what does group five mean, because there's nothing you know, clear about what group five is. And group five is the edge group five. And larger number enables a longer encryption key. And what does lifetime mean? And lifetime means we're gonna renegotiate the keys after one hour. Okay, and this is more straightforward here. Hash, encryption, pre-shared key. So I try to put some comments along the way to help you out. And then if you need to, you can take a closer look at IKE phase one and phase two. I'm, I'm not gonna move on until this makes sense. So let's come back. Let me make this a little smaller, not this small here. What would you like to see? Okay. So this is still working. Okay. And after 15 minutes, because the IPsec lifetime is 15 minutes, it's gonna fail for, I don't know, you know, 20, 30 seconds, because we are negotiating a new security keys and then it will come back up and keep going. But we're not gonna sit here for 15 minutes. And when you do this on your own, you may wanna go with one minute, or we can redo this with one minute and then we can see what happens. And what's nice about what we did here is you can come back and change the parameters. You can say, I don't wanna use AS, I wanna use 3DES, or I wanna use AS, a different encryption key. I don't want to use SHA, I want to use MD5. You can change it. Mix and match until it makes sense to you. So what questions do you have?
Uh, would using IPv6 make this any more efficient? We are using IP. Did you say V6? Right. Okay, thank you very much, Robert. No, 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 no. It, 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 it's exactly the same process. The only difference are the IPs right here. So you would be using an IPv6 IP instead of an IPv4 IP. But the rest of it is exactly the same. And just for historical purposes, interview purposes, IPsec was designed for v6. And it is built into v6. It's built in. It's like buying a radio and, sorry, buying a radio, buying a car, and it has a radio. It's, it's there. You know, and if it's a good radio, use it. It doesn't make any sense, you know, to bring another radio with you because there's a radio built into the car. And IPsec is built into v6 and is made available for v4, like you saw. But it was designed with v6. Remember, v6 is the future. And they think of IPsec as the future of VPN, but the future is already here. It's already the gold standard for IPv4 and IPv6 VPN. Questions on anything we've covered? All right, this is what I wanna do. I'm gonna let you digest. There's a lot of stuff to digest. And please practice between now and Wednesday and Thursday because we're gonna finish, I'm not done, I wanna do one more lab, but I'm not going to do a packet tracer lab. <clears throat> we have two more labs, we have a, a remote user to a site lab, and then we have uh, IPsec over frame relay, uh, because if you remember from an earlier slide, it said compatible, and I just wanted to show you that IPsec would work over any uh, wide area network uh, architecture. But it's not much different from this lab. It's just over a frame relay. But this is what I want to do. So I'm using Windows 10, just like you are using. And Windows 10 has a VPN, a client software built into it. I don't think it's very popular, uh, but it's there. And that's all you really need to establish a VPN from Windows 10. They've given you the software for the client and for the server. So you can configure a VPN server because you need a VPN server and then you can configure a different Windows 10 as a client and then you can VPN between the two. But let me show you. Let me show you the options. So this is VPN. Go to VPN and add a new VPN. How many of you have used VPN before? For anything, how many of you have VPN over the public internet to anything? To home, a lot of people VPN home. I have. Okay, this is, and what did you use it for, and? I use it to VPN to Oregon State's network for work. Okay, very good. And then you will get an IP address from OSU, right? Right. Yep, and as far as the network is concerned, you are on site. It doesn't really know you're in a coffee shop because you have a local IP and you're sitting behind the firewall and it's going to treat you like a member of the family. So this is the VPN client that is built into Windows. I've never used it uh, because when I work for HP, you know, they used a third party VPN client. We at one point used the Cisco Any Connect. Let me show you everybody. And there's a ton of them. Okay, Cisco, any connect? Okay, so this is, how do I, what is, okay. Cisco, any connect is a unified security endpoint agent that delivers multi-security services to protected any connect clients are available across a broad set of platform, blah, 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 blah. And it uses IPsec, okay. And we use a different, third party, we never really used the built-in, but it's built in. And I'm guessing the people that did this at HP, you know, they looked at all of them and they said, no, we don't like the Microsoft VPN client for whatever reason. And they chose a, a third party. But provider built in, got everybody connect name, OSU. Okay, we, this is LBCC class. 
Okay, I want a VPN into LBCC. And I'm sure LBCC offers a VPN service. In fact, they offered it to me. And I said, I don't really have any devices that I use inside the LBCC network. I use Net Academy, it's in the cloud. I use Moodle, it's in the cloud. I use Gmail, it's in the cloud. I said, you know, everything I need is in the cloud. I don't really need a VPN client. Uh, I wouldn't get any value out of it. And I didn't, I mean, it would have been interesting just to see what they chose to do for VPN, but I don't really need it. So I declined the offer. A name, connection name, server name, or IP address. So you can do a fully qualified domain name or an IP. Uh, 123.1.1.1, everybody. This is the part I really want to bring you to. VPN type, okay. All of these are VPN protocols, okay. So I'm sure you remember PPP, uh, point to point from uh, CIS 154. We covered PPP in CIS 154. Well, this is PPP for tunneling. So if you want to, you can tunnel using PPTP. So this is one tunneling option, okay. Down here is L2TP layer two, transport protocol using IPsec with certificate. Do you guys remember, you know, you can use certificate for authentication or you can use a pre-shared key. And to use a certificate, both ends have to have a digital certificate and you have to exchange the public key. So I'm gonna go with pre-shared, but before I come here, you can use a secure socket tunneling protocol and you see IKE everybody, and this is version two. Okay, so an IKE is an option, but you can see IKE is IPsec, IPsec, IPsec. But Microsoft is saying choose, here you are. Okay, we're gonna give you a variety of different tunneling protocols and you choose. And basically you have to choose what the server supports. So I can choose, you know, IKE, and then the server doesn't support IKE. Makes sense, everybody? I cannot choose point to point, and then the server doesn't support point to point. So I have to choose a protocol that the server supports because at the end of the day, you're connecting to something and that something has to support your request. And then let's say, you know, pre-shared key, and then what's the pre-shared key, you know, password, okay. And username, how do you wanna authenticate? Username, you wanna use a smart card, you wanna use a one-time password, you wanna use a certificate. So it's giving you a list of options and smart cards are very popular with uh, VPNs. And, but let's say, you know, I have name and then Zico and then, uh, and I would click on save, and then I will double click on that icon, and then it will establish the VPN connection for me. Of course, this is not gonna work because I don't know, there's, not, there's nothing at the other end. I just wanted to show you that uh, Windows 10 supports client and server. So if you want to experiment, if you've never done VPN and you find it interesting, which I hope you do because it's widely, widely used, and you want to do some labs on your own, you can do. All you need is just two Windows devices and you can configure one as a server and you can configure one as a client and then you can VPN between the two. I want to stop here for today, but I would love to answer your questions. I know your brain is full. I don't want to uh, put more information on the table right now. We still have Thursday. I will do a review on Thursday and then we can finish the two remaining labs. And please do yourself a favor between today and Thursday and go over the Net Academy material. And you may want to go over the one lab we did together in the class. It would help greatly. Otherwise, you're going to come back on Thursday just as confused as you are today and then I'm going to throw more stuff at you and you're not gonna be able to digest it. So see how much you can digest of what we've covered today, and then we can finish this conversation on Thursday. But before we leave, do you have any questions? And so, no, we're good. Bill, is this all making sense to you?
Yeah, yeah, I think uh, I just need to uh, let it marinate and uh, go over the lab slowly. Um, okay. But yeah. Please, please start with the Net Academy material. Ignore the slides, start with the Net Academy material. I think that's a better place to start. Watch those two videos, you know, a couple of times or the parts that don't make sense again and again until they make sense. And then finally do the packet tracer lab. Uh, and I think you will be ready for the rest of this conversation on Thursday. And I'm not gonna re keep repeating myself, you know, VPN is, is the norm and IPsec is the gold standard. And that's something we, we definitely need to get our brains around and feel very comfortable with. So have a great day, everybody. And I look forward to seeing you on Thursday to finish this conversation. We're good? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, thank you, Zico. Okay, goodbye, everyone. Bye, Bye. Zico. Have a good day. You too.